Good morning, afternoon, or evening to everyone. My name is Frank Place, and I am the director of the Policies, Institutions, and Markets CGIR Research Program, or PIM as we call it. I am pleased to welcome you to today's launch of the book, African Farmers, Value Chains, and Agricultural Development. The continued development or strengthening of food value chains as a key driver of agriculture development and food system transformation remains a priority of governments around the world. We have also seen value chains featuring a dialogue at the UN Food System Summit and in many analyses and discussions in relation to COVID-19 and its effects. The development of food and agricultural value chains is of paramount importance in Africa, where agricultural productivity remains at low levels, poverty levels remain high, and a large cohort of youth are in need of decent jobs. The book is partly inspired by the work on value chains conducted in the PIM program, in which the two authors have participated as researchers and leaders since 2017. A significant share of that research has taken place in Africa. Our program, uh, PIM program on value chains attempted to uh, address many questions, but, but among those were, which interventions are most effective in reducing risks and under what circumstances? Which interventions best address high transactions costs and under what circumstances? And how does the heterogeneity of smallholders and small rural enterprises affect, uh, affect their need for different ways to interact within value chains? Uh, you will see as if you read the book that the book captures all of these questions very well. Uh, the authors uh, try to summarize these as well as many other relevant studies uh, from the global literature. They also put the research into context by noting some of the unique features of Africa's value chain development, both historically and across different com contemporary settings as well. So I won't say more about the book because I'll let the, the authors do that. So let me now just introduce our speakers today. Uh, the two co-authors, one is Erwin Bolt. He's professor of development economics at Wageningen University, and he's co-leader of our PIM flagship three on inclusive and efficient value chains. Alan DeBrow is a senior research fellow in the Marcus Trade and Institutions Division at the International Food Policy Research Institute. And he also leads two of the clusters that we have uh, in Flagship 3 on value chains as well. And then uh, our discussant today is Hope Mickelson. She's an associate professor at the Department of Agricultural and Consumer Economics at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, which is where I got my undergraduate degree. So. It's a very outstanding institution. Uh, now, before I turn it over to the, the speakers, let me mention how our webinar will work. The question and answer period will be at the end of the program after all of our all of the speakers. Throughout the, the presentations, I encourage you to, to type in your questions in the chat window on the right side of your screen. Please type in your name and organization along with your question. We will compile them and try to organize them by theme before posing them to the speakers. And finally, we are recording the webinar and we'll make it available on the, in the PIM website shortly after the event. Now, having said that, I will say that what we're, we were gonna, Alan and uh, uh, Erwin are going to share a, a presentation about the book, then Hope Mickelson will spend a few moments making comments, uh, and then she will kickstart the discussion with a few questions. And then we will start integrating those in from the audience. So with that introduction, I will pass it over to our, our authors. Take it away. Thank you, Frank, for the introduction. And um, I'm pleased to start uh, talking about our book, African, Value, African Farmers, Value Chains and Agricultural Development. Um, really, I want to start with three motivating factors or facts that, that kind of underlie, underlie what we wanted to do um, as we started writing. And, and one is that the majority of land in Africa is farmed by smallholders. So I think. Many of us at IPRI, um, but beyond in the development economics field, uh, are motivated by finding ways to make um, livelihoods better for smallholders and, and people like smallholders in rural areas of developing countries. But in Africa, in this point, um, in this context in particular. The second motivating fact is that while these farmers depend on the ability to sell food on markets, they don't sell all of the the, their product on markets, but they often do. Uh, they really depend on the ability to sell that food on markets to pay for school fees and, and um, pay for other foods that they can't produce. Um, while they, they depend on that, 
markets don't always function well for these farmers or for that matter for other value chain actors um, such as traders or processors or, or uh, input dealers on the other side. Um, so we want to know, we wanted to think through in detail how to make these markets, what could be done to make these markets work better and then to catalyze a structural transformation in Africa like we're seeing in Asia at the moment um, and and like we've seen historically in other places. So we can call that structural transformation 2.0 and we call it that in the book because uh, really we think that the structural transformation, we're going to argue that the structural transformation that's going to take place in Africa is going to need to be different than the structural transformations that we've seen in other places. Okay, so we want to really start by by introducing four major concepts that we introduce in chapter one and then we follow throughout. And whereas I'm going to give you a, 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 some detail about the chapters in the book, um, I'm going to really focus on chapter one and some of these major concepts. And then Erwin's going to come in and talk about chapters eight and nine. So we're going to kind of give you the bread, but not the sandwich in the middle. Um, and these are four, these four con concepts, they are related, but they are transaction costs, relational contracting, trust, and market power and value chains. And our view, I think, evolved about all four of these, these major concepts as we were writing. And so I think that's why we want to highlight those to begin with. So what are we thinking about in terms of transaction costs? Well, we're taking a very broad view of how to define transaction costs here. Um, and there are lots of different potential transaction costs in agricultural value chains. Um, they're not just the cost of finding somebody to buy uh, groundnuts, as you see in the left, uh, fr uh, from and and um, you know finding those those markets and making a, a deal about them. There are also uh, there's there's a lot of transaction costs related to trust and selling or buying goods um, in liquidity in obtaining liquidity for investments, whether that be in the short term, thinking about inputs, or in the long term, thinking about uh, you know, making soil investments or, or even capital investments. There are transaction costs related to dealing with risk um, in terms of, of risks not only related to weather or climate, but also risks related to, uh, to pricing and, and finding actors and, and perishability. Um, there are transaction costs related to scale in terms of aggregating, and then of course, kind of the typical types of transaction costs we think about, like transporting to market, which can be uh, quite expensive when road, roads aren't. Somewhat related is the concept of relational contracting. And we note that most contracting in Africa is done through relational contracting. Um, and Something to note about relational contracts, some points to note about relation, relational contracting, making it different than more formal contracting, is that the information about the product that is going to be sold in a sales contract is not completely codified. Um, there's also a lack of third party enforcement in relational contracts, which implies that the agreements that come, up, come about need to be self enforcing, so everybody's got to agree. Uh, to, to um, they, they have to be self-enforcing, they have to be enforced by the, the parties themselves rather than a third party potentially, um, and they need to, therefore they need to be incentive compatible. Um, more formal contracting requires more complete, doesn't have to be absolutely complete, but more complete information about what's being contracted. Um, so the color and the size of the tomatoes that are being sold ra rather than, and, and potentially the breed, uh, rather than just that they are tomatoes. And then the potential for enforcement needs to be there. So if there's a dispute, you can go to a third party. Um, this, because of the need for relational contracting, there needs to be trust um, in selling those products or in buying those inputs. A key to the complex markets is to be able to control that quality, um, whether, and that, Quality can have many definitions. Um, it may require farmers to use specific inputs. If you're thinking about a products in an output market, they, 
uh, these contracts may require farmers to use specific inputs or handling procedures. I'm thinking about organics here. Um, so those are, those are those are more like process uh, processes in growing crops. And that can help us move from relational contracting to more formal contracts um, if there is if we can trust people in general. Um, another thing that helps trust is immediate payments to invoicing, which can be an issue um, uh, in in more formal contracts, how long it takes to make those payments. Um, smallholders may be or feel cheated by middlemen um, for a variety of different reasons, and that's one reason that they might shy away from uh, from trusting them. Um, it could be that they they perceive that low price prices are offered. Um, middlemen can use um, scales that mismeasure the weight of crops, um, and we've we point out examples of this taking place. Um, there are disagreements about crop quality uh, attributes that, that occur. And then there can be uh, problems with actual payments of invoices for, for crops. Um, so once you get away from immediate payments, that can be a, a, a problem. And smallholders, we, we point out evidence that there are ways that smallholders cheat on these um, implicit contracts as they sell things they mix rocks or stones in into the middles of bag the middle of bags of crops for sale etc and all of these concepts back so far relate back to transaction costs okay so the fourth issue is an interesting one that we've thought through very carefully and, and that's market power and value chains so when market buyers have market power um, when there's one buyer for 100 farmers, and we'll come back to that example just as, as a broad example, they have more control over the margins um, that the, the, the essentially the margins within the value of, the, of those crops. And farmers are invariably going to receive lower prices for crops than they would under a competitive equilibrium if there's a market power uh, issue. So there are kind of three ways that we point out that market power can arise. Um, one is search costs can be it can be costly to find a different buyer so one local monopoly arises as a result because there's only one person buying the product um, specialized products uh, can create market power as well um, so these are products that require specific specific handling um, and that could be related to sustainability standards quality standards or even special products with niche markets um, Moringa is one that I, I comes to mind all of a sudden for, for some reason that, that's a special product from Ghana um, in particular. Um, and then exports uh, often cause natural monopolies to, to take care of costs related to exports. If you think of specific export products, there are often natural monopolies that, that arise. Um, and that kind of brings up the point that market power can, um, can be negative if if we're thinking about local monopolies over, over maize buying. But it can also be an advantage, particularly in these specialized product or export markets. And if you think about it, uh, um, this is, it, it can create improved input provision, um, particularly when somebody has real reason to sell specific crops. Um, those markets may not even exist without that market power. So, one of the things we try to point out in the book is that uh, market power has this, this double-edged sword in um, in value chains. Okay, so the my last couple of slides, I want to tell you what we don't do in the book um, because this is something we want to we want to be very careful, clear about. Um, so one thing we we only lightly touch upon are food systems, which has become the buzzword. We're really focused on on both the smallholders, but then also the value chains that they're selling crops into, rather than thinking about the food environment and, and um, from a, or thinking from a consumer perspective and the like. Um, so we really only lightly touch upon food systems thinking here um, because we're so focused on, on the, the value chain itself. Uh, we focus on domestic rather than international markets. Um, for the reason that we think that, well, not just that we think, the bulk of food in Africa is sold on domestic markets. Um, that said, imports can be particularly cheap in the coastal cities of West Africa, and they really compete uh, with domestic markets. And this is actually a challenge that, that um, 
West African economies in particular have uh, to, to think about and over, overcome. Um, there are political economy issues related to policy preferences, and those can be heterogeneous within countries. Um, urban, urban residents may have very different policy preferences related to value chains than, uh, than rural residents. Um, urban urban uh, residents tend to like cheap prices for food, and uh, rural residents like to have to, to have higher returns. So there's a there's an immediate tension, and we don't really talk that much about those policy preferences. We don't pay. Uh, we now two things that we think we didn't do enough of, um, and you could be the judge. One is that we well, I think that we don't pay enough attention to heterogeneity. Um, and our observations are likely colored by our research and other experience in Africa. So from my, my biases are towards the four or five countries that I've done the most research in and to Malawi where I was a Peace Corps volunteer and Irwin has his own biases. And we, we work, we try to work on um, being as broad as we can, but it's certainly something that, that I, I'm sure is there. And we don't pay enough attention to gender in the book. Um, all of the things that I've already mentioned, women face even more difficulty with these transaction costs and gender relations. And, and it's important to realize that gender relations are very heterogeneous across the continent um, as well. So I've, I've outlined chapter one to you. Um, in, a second, in the second chapter, we really give a brief historical overview of the development of agri African agricultural value chains. Um, we step back in chapter three and really think about economic theory and how value chains are governed, um, and then take that into chapter four and talk about a little bit more about the evolution of, of value chains in Africa, agricultural value chains, and how that occurs. Um, the three, the, the next three chapters are quite meaty. That we talk about smallholders and the way that they interact on markets. Um, about product quality and certification, and then storage and post-harvest loss issues and, and uh, issues that, that go on and relate to, to storage, such as uh, the development of commodity markets. Um, and the last two chapters are silver bullets, uh, where we, we talk about ways that have been uh, proposed as interventions or, or ideas that, that of, of interventions, and Erwin's gonna go through those now. Um, and then we, we give some things that we think can lead to structural transformation 2.0, um, as we call it. So I think at this point, I'm turning it over to you, Erwin. Thanks, Ellen. So the core of the book is really about the nitty gritty of, of storage and warehouse receipts and, uh, and finance and all of that. And towards the end of the book, we, we get towards more broad brush statements. And so in chapter eight, uh, we focus on a number of sil silver bullets, uh, or so we call them. These have been approaches to value chain upgrading that have received quite a bit of uh, traction in policy circles and maybe also in academic circles. So we try to evaluate them. And for these particular five uh, bullets listed here, uh, I would say mega farm input subsidies, platforms, producer organizations, and ICT approaches, I think overall we find there's quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of support that these are good ideas, but overall neither of them is likely to be a panacea. And what we do in chapter eight is essentially discuss the motivation behind these approaches to value chain upgrading and development. Then we look at the uh, at, at the evidence, the empirical evidence, and then we propose a number of reasons why sometimes the outcomes uh, lag behind the expectations. So uh, can you go to the next one, Alan? So I have prepared a number of slides where we very briefly uh, uh, discuss these concepts. So the first one, uh, mega farm. So these are not. This is not, let's say, small scale farm consolidation. This is the idea that really there's a problem in Africa because farms are too small and they're further splintering into smaller units, and this cannot be uh, sustainable. This not does not create uh, conditions for. Uh, sustain productivity growth. And what's needed instead are large scale farms, capital intensive production units. And um, we review some of the, the, the evidence finding that essentially there is a track record of failed efforts in this uh, regard, dating back all the way to the colonial era. So, uh, even though there is reason to expect vertical integration if you, if, if you produce in, in uh, greater use, 
limits and there's undoubtedly economies of scale along certain uh, aspects of the uh, value chain, it also turns out that creating these bigger farms and managing them profitably is quite difficult. And uh, many of the deals that have been, the land deals that have been negotiated since essentially the, the, the food price spike in 2008, never really materialized into concrete uh, projects. Uh, partly that is because the customary land, uh, the system of land rights is, is very complex to negotiate for outsiders and unless you're willing to adopt a brute force approach or a very simplified approach, then this is likely to create a lot of uh, opposition and potentially a media fallout as well. We say a few things about monopsony power on labor markets, especially if you create large farms and something about the issues of monitoring. Um, overall, though, it's, I think there's few people now who expect mega farms to be the solution to African farming. There's maybe a larger group of people who have high expectations about systems of input subsidies. And this system started to, or this approach to promoting smallholder farming became much more popular uh, 15 years ago or thereabouts, after, especially after some uh, crop failure in, uh, in Malawi. The response was to, uh, to set up uh, an input subsidy program, which generated or seemed to have generated positive uh, uh, results, especially uh, in the first year, and then was copied and upscaled uh, in, in other countries. So, at least 10 African countries now run subsidy programs for inputs, such as fertilizer and improved seeds. And the expectation is if, okay, if we can increase uh, yields, if we can close the yield gap, then these larger volumes, volumes might uh, catalyze value chain uh, development. But there's a lot of issues here as well, right, that we discuss in the book, and they extend from implications for the uh, for public finance. I mean, many of these subsidies are, or these subsidies are taken from the public budget, which means that they may crowd out other type of uh, uh, investments also in the agricultural sector that might be more uh, productive. There's targeting issues. It's very difficult to reach the, the, the smallholders that would otherwise not have access to these inputs. And there are crowding out effects for the private sector, unless, of course, you devise this uh, input subsidy scheme. Smart way. Um, so across the board, I think it's fair to say that the that the income effects of this are not as positive as we as we hope for, and many of these schemes are perhaps mainly maintained because they serve political purposes and uh, help politicians to uh, to meet their constituency rather than to promote development. Another approach, quite popular also in Wageningen, where I'm from, are uh, innovation platforms. The idea that uh, the the old school system uh, of a linear technology push uh, promoting development through extension systems is really uh, uh, not functional farmers should be regarded as co-creators of knowledge and they should be involved in early stages of uh, of development and design and meaningful development and change you can only have multiple actors change there be simultaneous all these people should be involved in uh, early stages of the planning process. Innovation platforms then are one tool to bring together stakeholders to jointly diagnose bottlenecks in the, in the value chain and come up with uh, solutions. Um, this seems like a very sensible approach uh, to me. I've looked together with some PhD students into the evidence supporting the claim that innovation platforms are conducive to agricultural development uh, and, and growth. Indeed, there is a little bit of of evidence uh, across the board on average there are positive effects on adoption and poverty effects really varying from platform to platform and these platforms can also only be maintained at relatively high cost when i talk about this with experts they tell me well many of those innovation platforms are hijacked by special interests including researchers including cg researchers who really enter the process of negotiation with already a preconceived mindset of what the solution should look like and that really then puts the horse behind the carriage so to speak the leadership of some of those platforms have been uh, has been a uh, question and many issues do not simply involve coordination failure that can be solved through bringing people together around the table but sometimes there's also zero some Games, right? That have zero some games that has to be that have to be addressed through something more than just coordinating 
solving a coordination problem. This brings us back to the issue of relational contracting and the limits of what can be agreed upon on a voluntary basis. Maybe the next one, Ellen. So the next approach, I think we're getting there. Oh, producer organizations. Yeah, that, that, that's an important one too. Uh, building on the very logical intuition that there's economies of scale, not only in production, but also in storage and in marketing and in extension, and that if farmers get together, they can jointly uh, do much better than, 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 when, than every farmer in isolation. When you look at the impacts of uh, producer organizations, on average, again, you find that there are positive effects. There's income gains, for example, of farmers who join these organizations. But here, there are also real transaction costs uh, involved in participating in uh, producer organizations, becoming a member, but also just participating in meetings, etc. The management ability or the leadership of these organizations varies from context to context and quite often there's coordination challenges that cannot easily be overcome including of course the temptation as a member to side sell right if there is a producer organization in the neighborhood that is an alternative option for you to turn to then your bargaining position on the spot market also improves so you may be able to get higher prices there in that sense the producer organization provides a public good but for every individual farmer it's better maybe to side sell so you need to overcome these types of problems and then sometimes people argue that there are issues with uh, inclusion because depending on the type of organization that we are looking at whether this is a community based or a, or a market based or, or or a commodity based organization sometimes poorer farmers selling quality of more variable uh, or products of more variable quality are excluded. So the bigger issue here, I think something that, 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 that I've learned through conversations with experts on this issue is that it is really not possible to roll out a producer organization policy agenda and to build these things left and right in order to reap these economies of scale because it turns out so many things can go wrong uh, um, at the organizational level. The more successful ones, and they certainly do exist, have typically formed endogenously around charismatic leaders in response to problems that were diagnosed by the farmers themselves. It's very hard to impose this approach top down, but where it exists and where it works, great. Ellen? Ah, ICT, finally. Mobile phones, it's very easy and tempting for us to think that this will transform agricultural markets, right? Because ICT not only has, to, uh, has the potential to reduce transaction costs by improving information flows, it also provides access to all sorts of additional financial services, which could be served for payment, but also to create informal insurance networks, uh, etc. Yet careful analysis of the impacts of, uh, of ICT on <coughs> rural households <coughs> produce outcomes that are small, mixed, uh, although I would say on average mildly positive, but not nearly as optimistic as maybe we thought some 10 years ago after most of us read the, the Jensen paper in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, which was of course a very positive uh, contribution. Part of the reason, among many others, is that rural farmers uh, uh, face multiple constraints at the same time as we emphasize throughout the book, and that only addressing the, uh, the information constraint or only addressing a payment constraint is unlikely to transform rural uh, economies. Moreover, if you think about, for example, public uh, pub accessing public services and, and e-extension type of approaches, in light of the heterogeneity of the, of the production environment and the market environment, some of this some of this information would have to be tailored and, and context specific, um, but it's also very vulnerable, right? Information just flows from the recipient to his neighbors and his brothers and everybody else, which really means that the public good nature of information really means that market demand for this is unlikely to materialize, right? There's very little, very few people are willing to pay to obtain information through their phone, um, which really means that this activity would have to be subsidized maybe for an uh, for an uh, indeterminate uh, time period which is ne not necessarily a problem but it also takes away i think from the image of ict as something that promotes market mediated uh, growth next one please ellen so if not any of these things in isolation then what right because uh, 
um, Alan already mentioned uh, structural transformation. We believe that old school structural transformation is unlikely to happen in Africa simply because per unit production costs in the industrial sector are high, high compared to production costs in Asia, in China, in Vietnam, and in other countries there. So when Asian, when, when the Europeans industrialized, there were no competitors on the on that market. When the Asians uh, industrialized, they were competing against the Europeans, where at that time wages were high. But now the Africans are competing against the Asians. And it's unlikely that they will be uh, able to compete on the market for labor-intensive manufactured goods uh, um, without support, right? So what then, if not copying and pasting lessons learned in other parts of the world? We believe it would be wise to exploit the comparative advantage the African continent has in primary goods production and maybe also in agriculture-based industrialization, which then would imply a focus on both the supply and the demand side, right? And I have something to say about both of these things. So uh, for the demand side, for example, uh, focus on uh, domestic markets, regional markets, maybe also through trade measures, uh, as has been tried in other regions of the world in the past. So needed for sustained productivity gains are not only the silver bullet type of things that I mentioned earlier, because these are obviously important, but we need to do more. And what we do in this chapter is highlight four different things that we believe are important. The first one would be bundling interventions. Uh, the silver bullet approach by itself already suggests that some people had high expectations about specific interventions and thinking, if only we do this, if only we fix this constraint, then something will happen. Well, quite often it's not like that. Researchers have tried to uh, promote this line of thinking because, of course, we are interested in, in attributing the impact uh, to specific changes in uh, or specific interventions. So as, as a researcher, I'm always happy if the implementing agency is willing to change one thing at a time. However, unfortunately, as emphasized throughout the book, the, 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 the prevalence of transaction costs in all directions means multiple constraints at the same time and fixing one constraint at the same at, at a time is unlikely to, uh, to buy you much uh, uh, in terms of economic development. So we need to overcome multiple constraints at the same time if you want to increase productivity. And we, in the book, we cite a number of examples where this has been done, right? Also randomized controlled trials where bundles of inputs are provided to farmers, not just information, but also inputs themselves, maybe also insurance and maybe also a guaranteed output market. And if you see, if you start to bundle bundle uh, uh, interventions, then the, then the response from the farmer is typically much higher and it can also be sustained over time. The second approach is smart farm consolidation. So not a, a naive push towards mega farm in the colonial tradition, but something between smallholders and mega farms. Because the, I think at, among some of us at least, the idea has taken root that that, that tinkering and pampering sm smallholders is in a way akin to perpetuating poverty because there's only so much, of course, there's only a certain income level that can be obtained from a very small farm, even if productivity goes up by say 30 or 40%. So what we do in this chapter is very carefully discuss the, uh, the, the hypothesis about the inverse relationship between size and productivity. And we sort of dismiss that and we argue that indeed there is a case for larger farms and maybe not uh, uh, maybe not everywhere but uh, one possible model for example could be hub and spoke type of outgrower systems where larger farms work together with smaller farms in the neighborhood uh, providing inputs and uh, and information and also providing uh, let's say a, a guaranteed market for the for uh, sufficiently high quality crops produced the advantage of these types of models, unlike the, bu the bundled interventions that I, that I mentioned earlier, is that some of this might be market mediated and not be dependent on subsidies. If we look at the bundled interventions that I mentioned earlier, the examples from the literature, at least one of them, to some extent, still relies on public uh, funding. Of course, a hub and spoke type of model really means creating market power, right? The, 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 the hub in the middle is going to set the prices and determine to a large extent the conditions of the trade with many sm small farmers surrounding it. So uh, um, 
is this beneficial or not? Uh, uh, maybe there's scope here for uh, for government regulation, and I, I assume that this may be a topic that we will be discussing later. The next thing, the next building block, I think, of a structural transformation uh, approach would have to be infrastructure interventions, and then mainly the creation or the paving of, of rural roads. Uh, if there's one thing that I've learned uh, preparing this book and reading through a whole bunch of papers is that the, the, the return of investment in infrastructure is supply, surprisingly high, typically, and it's also uh, fairly robust for, uh, for a range of reasons. Now, establishing uh, causality in these types of uh, uh, research projects is not so easy because, of course, roads are never placed randomly, at least let's hope not. But the careful work that I've seen suggests that the returns of investing in infrastructure really complement some of the other things that we have talked about. And then finally, the issue of, of, of somehow creating domestic or regional demand for the output that is produced. So this goes back to the idea of uh, of Chung, for example, that uh, Korean uh, Korean economist based in, in Cambridge, who talks about kicking away the ladder. He noticed that many of the now developed countries in the past, at critical junctures of their development stage, protected their own primary sector, and to now deny this opportunity to uh, to other countries seems counterproductive. So many countries in Africa, at least the urban population, to a large extent rely on imported food. So, for example, I, I currently start, or I recently started a poultry pro a project in uh, in Sierra Leone, and to my surprise, I learned that 85% of the poultry meat and 85% of the eggs in Sierra Leone are imported. I mean, why can't Sierra Leoneans produce their own meat and chicken uh, and eggs? Right. So, what can we do to create the conditions where that can be happened. Now, import tariffs alone are obviously not the solution. It has to be part of a package, but cleverly designed, and maybe for it at a temporary nature, they can be part of a package that could, in this particular case, help promote the poultry sector in Sierra Leone. So we encourage African governments to think more creatively about working with potentially neighboring countries to, to create the conditions to foster the demand that would help to uh, to also get the supply response that we are so used to thinking about as uh, as economists. Final slide, please, uh, Ellen. So, in sum, and before I give the floor to to Hope, uh, of course, agricultural productivity gains are necessary, maybe even a precondition for sustained growth, right? And the excellence in breeding initiatives and others are uh, on the radar, and they should be. But it's never going to be enough, right? We need to have well-functioning markets, and for that we need to have initiatives that bring down transaction costs, not just in one direction, but in multiple directions simultaneously. And for that, the government will have to play a role. And international uh, donors and international agencies will also have a role to play in this process. And when when taking stock of the evidence and when discussing this over a cup of coffee, Ellen and I were at least moderately optimistic that these processes can occur. We close. As I see, Frank, this is a hint that I should be stopping, right? But yeah. but by making the simple observation that when you look back in history and you look at critical junctures in in history when development took place, for example, the industrial revolution in England or or the the, the field the building of of, of trade networks uh, in in Europe in the in in the 14th century. On average, there are gains, and this has been productive, but there are winners and losers, right? And so, for example, during the 14th century, when trade in Europe intensified, the people grew shorter, not longer, suggesting that on average they ate less rather than more. And during the Industrial Revolution in England, some 50 million people left Europe because there was nothing for them to do, and they fled, fled. They, they left for the, for, for the U.S. And we argue in the book that maybe, uh, maybe we should expect that agricultural development in Africa will also create winners and losers. This is not necessarily a win-win proposition, right? Especially when we start to think about the consolidation of farms, and people will be displaced, and there will be re there will be more employment in the countryside, but maybe not for everybody. Where should people go, right? And we develop this very loose argument in favor of regulated migration towards other parts of the world that could be beneficial for everybody. But uh, that's not really worked out, so we'll see whether that creates room for discussion later. Thank you very much, and apologies for taking more than my share.
No, no problem. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Alan and Irwin. Now let me invite Hope to make some comments and kick uh, maybe kick off the discussion with a couple questions. Over to you. Absolutely. Yeah, so I'll keep my um, comments brief so that we can get to the questions, which I think should be a lot of fun. Um, so I do want to begin by saying that the book's ambitious and economical, which I think is a really rare combination. So it's also a lot of fun to read. As they state in their introduction, they're focused on the exchange relations of small farmers so how trans, high transactions costs in particular in input and output markets um, are affecting farmer decisions and outcomes and how reducing those transactions costs could have potentially in, uh, transformative effects on food security and on poverty in the region. So it's a really nice framing for this very broad um, but effective synthesis that they do of the thing before the, the webinar to them of both sort of older literature and then some of the frontier work that's being done. And I, I found that really um, distinguishing in the in the book and then they managed to do this all really concisely so the book's less than 200 pages I read it on a weekend where I was parenting a seven-year-old and we went to see the Nutcracker and I you know I was still able to read the book and, and really um, enjoyed it so I want to mention three specific strengths of the book that that I think maybe would will add to the characterization that they gave in their presentation and then let's get to some questions so one that I really, that they didn't talk about in the presentation so much, everyone mentioned it a little bit, is that they do present a history of African value chains as a part of chapter two, I think. And they start with pre-colonial farming and they include the colonial area that they talk about post-colonial policies for agricultural production, protection, excuse me, and taxation. And I, I, I really wanna emphasize that because I think it's powerful to include that. It's often not something that we do well as economists and even as development economists. And thinking about that um, really important context and the way that that affects institutions, that's all implied by the inclusion of that in the seventh chapter. And, um, and, and then they continue this actually in chapter four where they talk about the evolution of value chains in Africa. So it's really important because it gives this sense of dynamism and, um, and uh, you know, and, and context for the whole work. And um, so it's something that I, I really commend them for. I, I also, they did talk about this a little bit, but this discussion of silver bullet um, solutions is a nice contribution, I think. So packaging these five, so it's FDI, input subsidies, innovation platforms, producer organizations and ICT together and saying, listen, these have gotten a lot of attention. They have some merits. I'm gonna, we're gonna show you the evidence on them, but we need to think about why they're maybe not having the transformative effect that they are often promised to have. So, you know, they talk about the fact that these each independently has a certain appeal. They're prone to quote exaggeration and hyperbole. And they say, listen, none of these are going to be transformative if you apply them in isolation. And I, th I think that's a real contribution of the book. It's a bit provocative actually. Um, and I think that's something that would be fun to talk about a little bit. Um, and then finally, my last point and my my sort of the last thing I really want to identify is that they're they can be pretty provocative in this book. There's some moments where I found it um, that they were sort of pushing a little bit on I think people's expectations. So you know why why do we have this sociology of needing silver bullets, right? Well, they are engaging that a little bit when they're sort of forcing us or inviting us to re to be a little critical about, about those, um, those kinds of solutions that tend to be viewed with a lot of optimism and, and, and hope. So uh, I'll return to this kind of a few of the provocative um, topics or perspectives that they raise in the book in my questions uh, in a minute. But I do wanna say that in some of the books really a thoughtful contribution to research on small farms in um, Sub-Saharan Africa. And I'd really recommend it both for people who are new to the field. So I would happily hand this to, an ad, uh, to a graduate student, for example, who was beginning to think about doing research in um, ag and development, um, as it would sort of contextualize and sort of push them, I think, a little bit. Um, but then also, I think it's really valuable for more experienced research and policymakers. Um, in the way that it synthesizes the frontier with established literature and it asks these important provocative questions and proposes that maybe we need a new idea for what structural transformation is going to mean in this region of the world. It's really important region of the world. So let me, can I ask a couple questions and then we'll sort of move to discussion. So there's, there's two that I really want to 
bring up. So one's about the, the content of the book and one thing that they do really well. And then one is about the implications for researchers. And then let's maybe we can move to um, some questions from Frank and from folks in the audience. So the first is, uh, one thing that you do that I really like is that you discuss potentially pernicious effects of policies that are intended to help. Um, and I'm gonna give you two examples of this. So one is that you talk about, you have a really nice discussion of um, uh, quality in food markets and you know, possibilities for farmers benefiting from you know, the emergence of new markets that actually recognize quality in the way that can translate into um, you know, different kinds of in incentives for production and investments in production for small farmers. But you say, listen, the possible emergence of quality segmentation in agricultural markets so if an aflatoxin free value chain did develop, for example, you have to think about what happens to the contaminated maize. Nobody's going to throw that maize out, you, 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 know, you argue. So unless it's purchased by, as you say, an entity with social welfare in mind, it's going to be consumed by someone. And in this context, you need to worry about the potential for negative health externalities, right? So you're pushing there to think about, listen, we want these markets to develop. We want incentives for producers to make investments in their production and to sort in quality and to invest in quality attributes we know that that's important for agricultural development but if we want to think about the distributional effects on consumers for example you know we need to interrogate that the second example is that you talk about policies intended to make poor small farmers better off could have the opposite effect if by raising if improving their reservation position they undermine the scope for relational contracts and you say that as a result, farmers who are intended to benefit from these policies can actually be hurt. So I, wanted, I want you to talk about that a little bit more. So how common do you think these kinds of unintended outcomes are? What's the degree to which we need to be countenancing them when we propose, implement, and evaluate policies? And what are the sort of broader implications of, of these kinds of unintended consequences? Great. Over to you, Alan and Erwin. Maybe you can talk about the EFLA safe, Ellen. I think okay. and I'd be happy to take the other question. Okay, sounds good. Um, yeah. on the app, that sounds good. I'll be, again, brief because uh, I don't want to take too much time. But um, on the EFLA safe, that's a great question. And I think we've been talking about that at IFPRI, quite honestly, for I'd say six or seven years already. You know, we've identified, so to me, that wasn't a new thing. I just, uh, you know, it, it's, it's something we've been worried about since we've been doing work on on aflatoxin um, related research is that we're worried about the fa the poor you know afl aflatoxin getting um, uh, concentrated in, in poorer markets mm -hmm. um, right now the the markets haven't really developed for aflatoxin three grain mm -hmm. largely my impression is that we see um, we see big companies that are buying them for like chicken, buy, buying uh, maize for chicken feed, for instance. Mm -hmm. They really want aflatoxin-free maize because it gets concentrated in, in chicken. Um, so they'll set up their own supply chain essentially to get that mm -hmm. that maize in, the, the aflatoxin-free maize in. Um, or and, and WFP is similar in their LRP types of programs. Mm -hmm. They'll set up. They'll, they'll set up their value chains that way. Mm -hmm. um, if we did see a real bifurcation, I think that this becomes a, of those markets, we need to be really careful. And you know, it's our job as CGIR, I think, to be, ta um, be mindful of this problem. Um, and our, our role at, in particular as CGIR policy researchers, we need to be out there um, telling governments you need to buy up that that unsafe maize or mm -hmm. um, find ways to get uh, the safer maize into the uh, into the hands of consumers. Mm -hmm. But I think that's the way we should yeah. do the, you know, And so, you know, relatedly, this question of, you know, whether or not improving the reservation position of small farmers actually undermines possibilities for these kinds of relational contracts that are so essential to early stages of agricultural development. How do I think about that? Because so many of the policies and initiatives that exist are designed to do that and and do you think yeah. that your proposal for a structural transformation 2.0 sufficiently countenances that 
I'm sorry. Um, I think parts, yeah, that's a great As question. You, Go ahead, Erwin. Yeah, let me. Fr frankly, to some extent, it's, it's it's an empirical question. To what extent this is really important, right? Okay. And, yeah. I, I got three bits of evidence. I got three bits of evidence here that 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 at least made me think that it's not not unimportant. So I've done some lab in the field type of work with uh, traders and farmers in West Africa, where we varied the intensity of competition on levy markets, and there we found that input provision is indeed inversely correlated with uh, competition on local markets. If you make markets more competitive, if there's more, more trader, then each and every individual trader is less likely to expect that any upfront investment that he makes will generate fruits that he can pick himself. Because of course, right. after, after making the investment, the fruits may go to any other trader. So it's one thing to document this in, uh, in, a, in a lab. We've also documented this using observational data in Ethiopia when we looked at wheat markets. Mm -hmm. So together with a student of Tanguy Bernard, who may be on the call, I'm not sure. Uh, we've looked at the competition of uh, on local wheat markets in Ethiopia. And there we do find that wheat markets with fewer traders per farmer are the exact same markets where traders provide more inputs to farmers. So this really su suggests that something is going on. And this is work in progress, but uh, earlier this year, a paper came out in the Quarterly Journal of Economics by uh, Machiavello pointing at uh, uh, analyzing the coffee sector in Rwanda. And there the same thing happened, right? He said, okay, we have these coffee mills and we have coffee farmers. Now, what happens if we open up a few extra coffee mills mm -hmm. in the landscape? You would expect, well, that must be good news for the coffee farmers because now there's competition for the beans that they produce. They get higher prices, they produce more, everything starts to move in the right direction. But the reverse is true because mm -hmm. these farmers need assistance from the mills. And if there's multiple mills, then every individual mill hopes that somebody else will take the investment, but they will not, right? So as a result, the quality of beans pro produced by coffee farmers in Rwanda went down and the income of the smallholders went down. So to what extent this is a second order effect or a first order thing that we should that we should really recognize, I do not know. But we should be cognizant of of these complex dynamics. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's absolutely fascinating. And 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 yeah, actually, and maybe we can talk about this some other time offline. But I, I had a conversation with a woman who's a, a buyer for Olam who casually mentioned the same thing to me that they look for optimal markets in which there's just the right amount of competition. Um, exactly. Thinking about where they want to do purchasing, um, exactly. given the kind of investments that they need to make to make that. So that was pretty fascinating. Um, I wanted to so one, one. Yeah, sorry, please. Oh, no, no. I was going to say, if you think about this from a regulation perspective, then there's two dimensions to this, right? There's the regulation of entry, that is one yep. button that you can that you can turn, and the other one is the regulation of the maybe the prices that these incumbents charge or, or set, right? So there's two, two dimensions here that in theory you could exploit. Now in practice, of course, you cannot do this, right? You need to regulate local wheat markets in Ethiopia is complex. Although I should say traders in local wheat markets in Ethiopia need to have a permit. So there is already some regulation taking place. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I'm taking too long. No, no, it's okay. Actually, it looks like we're going to be able to extend about um, 10 minutes. So, Frank, why don't you take a few questions from the audience in the, in the Great. Time? Let me, I, yeah, we just have a couple that came in. So, and then we can come back maybe and wrap up on some of this. And, and I want to leave time also at the very end for a, uh, Alan and Erwin to make a final, my final points. And also mention how people can access the book, because I think we didn't get quite to that. I see the slide is up there. Um, yeah, I think there was one question that came from Martin Van Ginkel. He, he, uh, you know, I think after you presented uh, the 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 first part of the slides, uh, Alan, about mega farms, he came in and to talk about, yeah, but wait a minute, we 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 have a lot of evidence that medium sized farms are actually more productive, which you address later on in the, in the. Uh, in the uh, discussion, I think when Erwin came in, so so we know that actually this is this movement towards medium scale farms are happening in some countries. That's been documented by Tom Jane and others. Uh, actually, as part of the PIM program too. Yep. Um, not everywhere, but I guess so. The question is, do we just kind of let that play out, or is there some kind of government uh, actions that can be taken to help help streamline that process um, of, of of movement towards that? Yeah, good question, Frank. Um, 
I, I what we talk about in the book is that where there is land availability, this is already happening to some extent, but you can imagine uh, making a land concession, uh, not a massive land concession, but a, a medium scale or large, actually we should call it large scale, land concession um, predicated on investment in a specific type of crop, so a specific type of processing, and then um, predicated on working with the, farm, the farmers around there. Um, so you, you know, one I saw uh, in Mozambique that was USAID funded 10 years ago um, was a chicken feed. Chicken feed is really big, one of these big businesses. And these guys had put together a, a, a processing factory, so they needed soy, and that was harder for them to get at that time. But they also, you know, the way you want to run that factory is 24 hours a day um, to make the most money on your, your investment. And they they had enough land for say eight hours a day on average, so they needed to buy from local communities, um, yeah. and that creates the markets for for local communities as well. Right. Can, can I say something about this too? Sure. About yeah. the idea of reg regulating this process, I think that I mean, it, it is complex. But if we if there is no effort to to somehow uh, manage this, then you run the risk that these farm units get smaller and smaller because the population is growing and people hold on to the land. Unless, of course, there are alternatives. So I would think if you if you think about somehow managing this process, I don't think I, I don't think there should be policies that, that farmers should 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 lose their land or that they should sell it to their neighbor or that somebody comes in and kicks them off. But I'm thinking it would be great to 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 think about alternative approaches to create rural employment that would enable some people to sell part of their of the of their farm or all of their farm and, and do something else so that indeed consolidation will be a voluntary market mediated process and mm -hmm. to and to and to and to have that in mind and to maybe subsidize processes where this happens i think should not be dismissed out of hand quite the contrary Great. Thank, uh, thanks. Uh, so let me uh, come just to, there, there's two more questions I'll pose together and then we'll come back maybe to to hope for one more one more round of questions. Um, so, you know, you talk you, you said that you didn't talk a lot about political economy, but we, we also know there's there's evidence in Africa that there's a little, sometimes blurring between <clears throat> public and private sectors, <clears throat> excuse me, with um, powerful political interests also getting involved in, you know, profit making in the in the private sector as well. So a question came in from Miyamiko Kakwera from uh, Lalongwe University of Agriculture and Natural Resources in, um, in Lalongwe uh, to, to say, um, just to ask why this, this issue of cartels and, you know, in, in involving cor corruption and rent seeking was not uh, more explored in, in the book. And um, if you had any thoughts about that. And the other question, uh, actually the comment I guess he, he he asked about is related to whether, we, to what extent we really know about what kinds of farmers are able to respond to different kinds of silver bullets, because it's kind of mentioned in one of your slides that maybe the poorer farmers are not benefiting. Do we um, have really solid evidence around w which types of, uh, you know, interventions they can actually uh, get involved in and, and not? Or do we? Is that some it's an area where we need to consolidate a little bit more from the literature and and understand? Me to take it? Okay. Um, <laughs> we, <laughs> I think we. Um, so in terms of, actually, I think we touch a lot in the book on, um, at least indirectly on corruption. We we uh, point out that where there are places where uh, these implicit, the relational contracts break down. We point out where um, where the cheating takes place. Um, maybe not as much on the, on the market power side, but that's certainly something that can break down in these markets. And we, uh, I think we're, we're well aware of that. We don't maybe explicitly um, point that out, but I think, one of the things that we wanted that we thought was an interesting um, if you finding if you will as we thought through the literature that we were reading is that there is a role for market there's a really important role 
for market power in in developing agricultural markets. And um, you know, we don't want we wanted to make sure that that's explicit um, rather than kind of being all competition all the time as economists many times are. Um, go ahead, Erwin. Yep. Yeah, echoing to some extent what Alan said, in the book we do touch upon rent seeking, uh, maybe by domestic firms, maybe all in other contexts also by international firms. Uh, but what we don't really do in this book, and maybe that would be for a second edition, should there ever be one, is to pay some attention to the political economy side of things, the lobbying for specific policies. I mean, this is touched upon and it's mentioned, but it's never really worked out. Uh, it is an area, I think, that has been, where there have been changes over time, right? So this is also something, as, as Hope mentioned earlier, I mean, if you look at the historical perspective and you, you are think about the dynamism of all of this, then it's very easy and tempting to also write about the political, political economy side of things. Uh, and this could be, this could be done. Uh, we haven't done that yet. Which type of farmers? That other question, I think that is also interesting. This book is mainly focusing or almost exclusively focusing on smallholders. But even when, even within that subset, I mean, if you scratch the surface, yeah. you see many different types of farmers with different types of assets and, and opportunities. And I think right. there's quite a bit of literature, especially in the domain of the uh, of the silver bullets that we mentioned, that not all silver bullets are equally accessible to all these types of smallholders. We discussed this in the book, and we have a special chapter called Smallholders and Markets, where we where we flesh this out in more detail and distinguish between separable and non-separable household models and different types of market failure that preclude specific types of farmers from entering specific types of markets. I think that's Great. broadly a, a worry also in the certification chapter. Um, you know bring that up we, right we, we're worried about the fact that there are a lot of places where smallholders can get left behind great or certain uh, types of Sorry. yeah right right yeah exactly and i guess that motivates one of the, one of these uh, some of your conclusion that motivates it too about the the, you know, the inability for them to actually get out of poverty and you know thinking about migration and so forth i suppose now, uh, back to, so Hope, did you want to follow up with like maybe one final question? Yeah, I think one more question, given that there's probably some junior researchers on the call. I, I thought a lot as I finished the book about, um, you know, what you could suggest regarding how researchers would engage more fully in this concept of a structural transformation 2.0 that you introduced. So you talk about how academic researchers have long welcomed or benefited from this more piecemeal approach to development because you can you know, more cleanly isolate the effects of individual policies. Um, and so you have these tractable research questions. But if you want a development policy that's going to bundle solutions, that's going to have special attention to big infrastructure projects. I mean, Erwin already was talking in the presentation about how the effects of those are really tricky to identify cleanly and convincingly. Um, so what roles can academic researchers or, you know, policy researchers, um, the research community more broadly play, you know, if you're talking to a younger economist or a younger development researcher in the space, what questions should they be asking? What methods should they be thinking about as we move forward? <laughs> Did you say you can go first, Ellen? <laughs> yeah, oh, wonderful. Um, okay, so there I have several answers, I guess. One would be that um, nothing we say precludes, you know, adding those um, multiple, those adding up bundles in piecemeal fashions mm -hmm. to learn about what works well and what works, what doesn't work all that well. Um, uh, I think um, there's a lot of work to be done. I mean, you could think about clean identification of, of infrastructure interventions. Mm -hmm. I think there are some that are out there, but um, but there's plenty to do um, in that if you learn about those infrastructure interventions that would take place in advance. And they actually take place. The one time that I've been involved in trying to plan something, um, our funding was long gone before the uh, <laughs> before the infrastructure investment actually yeah. took place. Um, I think 
I don't know. I think there are plenty of research. I don't think we did it, you know, a, a, I don't think our goal was to write down a number of research questions that like a research agenda out of this book. Um, mm -hmm. and that's certainly clear from the uh, the way that we we conclude it rather than coming up with, you know, with 10 things we think younger researchers should do. But I think with some more, you know, my my impression is that there should be some questions there um, that would come out of, of, of reading it. And, um, you know, measurement, way, new new ways of measuring things, I think, is mm. something that's not there. But uh, in thinking about a silver bullet for, for research, we are starting to think about new ways to measure yield. Or there are people who are working on satellite measurement and whatnot. And, being creative about measurement, I think, is a, a, a really open, wide open. Um, but uh, it is tricky, uh, Hope. Mm -hmm. I, I do think you 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 really raise a very difficult question, and I, I mean we cannot do justice to the question with a few remarks here. But but. Uh, so part, I can clearly see that agricultural and development economists can continue doing what they do, right? They can just do their data collection at the household level. They can do their RCTs. We, we, we can do our diff and diff and IV models and, and, our, uh, and our other approaches to identification. But ultimately, if we're interested in systemic change, right, mm -hmm. something that occurs at a higher level, then it is not so obvious that we can do with only these approaches. I think we, we need to be a little bit more creative and thinking out of the box, what alternative methods are available to study these systemic changes, be it through more qualitative approaches, mm -hmm. case study level, mm -hmm. synthetic control approaches, if we believe that the system is a region rather than, uh, the, than a country, it will have to be a little bit ad hoc, but um, I, I agree that we cannot, we, we cannot just do the household level analysis and expect to gain a lot of understanding about how this type of development occurs, about the mechanisms of structural transformation 2.0. Uh, sure. Yeah, that's right. Great. All right. <laughs> well, thank you uh, very much, Hope. And uh, so Erwin and Alan, did you want to say, maybe say something about how to, uh, I see the slide is yep. up there again. You might want to say something about that. And if there's any final points you want to make. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a final point. You don't have a final point? That's great. Um, actually, one last point on, on Hope's question is that there's a lot to do to understand what's happening in the middle of value chains. Um, I, I know we we hate calling it the hidden middle but um, because it's not hidden, um, but uh, I think there's a lot of research that could be done in, in understanding a bit more how, how those transaction costs um, affect people's behavior uh, in the middle of value chains. And, and how those can be um, intervened upon. Um, to find the book, uh, we've provided a link. Um, there's, it's, it's, uh, we're, we're working with the publisher right now to figure out uh, a way to make it more available. Um, but there's a link on the slide. And um, let us know if, uh, by email if you uh, have, have questions about it. We'll, we'll figure out a way to get it to you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Alan. Yeah, yeah. At the moment, it's a, it's a little bit of a pricey uh, book, uh, as uh, but we're trying to work things out to see if we can find some way to 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 make it more accessible, like these yeah. silver bullets for the poor farmers that yeah, we were sorry. talking about. <laughs> so, no, but anyway, many thanks to everyone. Uh, no, it was a great uh, great uh, webinar, and thanks for the questions. And the book is great. I I don't actually have a copy of the book, and I didn't read the whole thing, but I was I did see a, an earlier manuscript, and I got to browse through that. And what I really liked about it was the detailed unpacking about what it means, what a value chain really means, and mm -hmm. the, all the issues associated with it, and just different ways to think about those issues. Because you know we we tend to have our own kind of natural biases about which they pointed out earlier in the, the discussion, and when, once you start you know, uh, peeling off layers, you realize things are not so simple, and it really and and things can move in different directions depending on the, the kind of context and circumstances. So I think you'll all find that very valuable um, if you, uh, in terms of your own research and thinking about it in the future. So uh, once again, uh, uh, thanks to uh, Erwin and Alan also, and congratulations for the great book.
And yes. thanks everyone. And the webinar will be uh, available on the PIM website so you can uh, share it with your friends and colleagues who couldn't join us today. Thank you very much.